Okay, so we have like half an hour for questions. Rogelio, how do we want to do this? There is a microphone somewhere? Good. So there is a question in the front, yeah. Hi, good evening. Um, I would like to push back a bit on what you were saying about Michelle Obama. I particularly, knew. <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm a black woman, you cannot say anything yeah, yeah, bad yeah, about yeah, Michelle yeah. Obama. Um, particularly her construction as this more feminine, um, more docile woman. And um, that overlays her, the discrimination against her as both black and a woman, right? So the stereotypical, it fights against the stereotype of, of, against us that we are not feminine enough and we are not worthy of male protection, particularly through the institution of marriage, right? So pushing her out as Susie Homemaker, as a domestic woman is actually revolutionary um, because she's a domestic woman, yet she's not a domestic, right? So that construction of her, I, I don't see that as problematic because of what it is going towards. How do you call it? Susie what? Susie Homemaker, you know, so, Donna so I, I, Reed. I, I'm going to quote Susie Homemaker. I, I push back by saying that if you are right, we should be able to document that with how people out there are looking at her. And, but I give you this point, obviously. When she was sort of retooled, yeah, and reintroduced to the American, to the white public, yeah? So let's be also honest to ourselves. We view her in a different light. We sort of know, okay? And we have, a, rightly or wrongly, a sort of deep knowledge or a perception that we have a deep knowledge of who she is. And we're happy, let's be honest too, we're happy that Obama did something that many black men of his standing don't do. He married a black woman. If had he married a white woman, he would not have gotten 95% of the black vote, yeah? That's why, why uh, what's his name? Harry Ford. He will never be elected. He will never get 50% plus of the black vote. So I give you that. But I think that what, what, what we think is important, but not central in understanding how whites have imagined and perceived Michelle now. So we still basically say, okay, keep doing your hula hula. We know better. We know you are a strong black woman. You know that you push back on, on Obama and that at night you spank him hard and like, oh, you don't know what you're doing. Let me tell you what you should be doing. But that is our construction. That is our imagination. I don't think that that's how white folks are looking at her. Now, again, it remains to be seen, and I hope that uh, those of you interested in this subject write papers. Or, I mean, there are people already working on this, so if you are interested in this, be quick <laughs> and write the paper right soon. Thank you for your question. Hi, Dr. Benito Silva. Yeah. Um, as you mentioned, racism is alive and well, but I'm curious if you would argue that this new racism or colorblind racism is perhaps more dangerous or at least more sinister than overt racism, because at least with overt racism, it is visible and therefore easier to confront. But when driven underground or obfuscated, it is more difficult, if not impossible, to eradicate because you cannot fight what you cannot see. Good question, and let me give you a long answer. The long answer is this. If you ask me, do you, I have, I've gotten this question, versions of this question many, many times, and from the minority side, I get the question of, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And I always say, absolutely not. We are no longer enslaved, in part because we fought, remember. Half a million African Americans engaged in, uh, actions against uh, slavery, plus we, those of us who were still enslaved, fought by all means necessary against slavery, yeah? Killing massa, oh, you want food? Yeah, <laughs> it has special sauce, yeah? Um, during Jim Crow, the same thing, and today we're still fighting, so my, my first component is that because we have struggled, we have forced changes from slavery to Jim Crow to the new racism. Now, we are in this new phase, in this moment where nothing is what it seems. That's why I always use the Alice in Wonderland metaphor to explain what the reality we're navigating. We have a black president, and it doesn't mean as much as we thought it was going to mean. So on the one hand, in this new racism period, 
there are some doors, yeah? So look at this room, look at your dean, look at the chair of the studio department. We are not the kind of uh, people, like minority leaders that I described today. Neither Rogelio Sainz nor Eduardo Bonilla Silva are sort of a lacayos del régimen, yeah? So we fight and we are strategic actors, but we're not silly. At the same time, I'm concerned about what will happen, and in other work, I have talked about the potential of the U.S. racial order becoming Latin America-like, where race sort of dissipates, and we all claim we are beyond race, like happens in Mexico, Brazil, Puerto Rico, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If all these things happen, and the new racism sort of gels, particularly the second component, the, 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 the Latin Americanization of race stratification, then your concern is valid, and we may be in a worse predicament because it's not even space to fight. We are not there yet, and we still can fight, and we still have some power, political power, and space to fight back. Things could potentially turn worse if we do what Puerto Rico did for years. It's like, oh, we don't need to get data on race because we don't have race, We're all Puerto Ricans. If you end up in that corner, you cannot even document inequality. You cannot talk about race, but race matters, yeah? So it, it all depends on, on what happens in the next 20, 30 years, and a lot of that will depend on what we, the people, do. If we people of color keep uh, on the colorblind dream, that's it. And then we may end up in a slightly worse position than the Jim Crow period, because the Jim Crow period, at least we could fight, we could make it visible, we could put a, you know, do a documentary. But how do you do a documentary of people go, well, actually, some people are doing it, yeah? You go to stores and you are followed. What is that show? by John Quinones, what would you do? You may watch, actually, he does a lot of stuff on race. If you never watch that show, check it online, good stuff. So, so it's, it's an open question whether this regime will become more problematic or less. Professor, thank you for coming to San Antonio and UTSA. Um, one element of the Obama administration that you don't deal with is how his election and re-election so threatened and antagonized just about everyone on the right, the Republican Party, the emergence of the Tea Party, um, people terribly frightened of a black man being successful in the White House and thus leading to more elections of more candidates like that. It seems to me that that in itself created a discussion and awareness about race that, that you don't uh, address or that I didn't hear you address today. I, I don't think anything has happened in our time comparable where we have seen people openly work against a president being successful, they say it's not about race, but I think all it of us is. agree it's, it is about race. What else could it be about? And I wonder how you see that. And it, that seems to me in itself perhaps the most powerful element of the Obama, uh, of the Obama administration's, uh, you know, the fact that he is a black man. Right. Uh, we also, two, two things. One, we have to go back to the Bill Clinton times. And let's, I mean, Bill Clinton was impeached. Bill Clinton was accused of every possible thing, okay? So one can sort of disentangle somewhat the existence of a right wing that will not accept anything that smacks of liberalism, yeah? So that's sort of an independent force in American life in the last 30, 40, 50 years, yeah? The second component is, and let me give you my answer through analogy. In the 19, 18, 1828, 1930 or so, the enlightened segment of the bourgeoisie, of the elite, decided to push for reforms such as, you know, uh, social security, rights for workers, etc. Even though plenty of the elements of the class, of the group, were not in line with that argument, okay? So I'm suggesting that today, those whites supporting the Obama argument are the enlightened version of, of white America who know, and I don't think it's a conspiracy, but you know, they are doing the right thing of pushing for their best interest. Those who want the most conservative versions of white America, who want us to go back to a softer version of Jim Crow, I think are missing the historical boat. This new regime that is working with, I call it multiracial white supremacy, following the work of Dylan Rodriguez, at Riverside, I think. Uh, I think it's more pernicious, potentially, than the softer version of the Jim Crow 
that uh, conservative whites may want for us in America. So in a sense, the support of white liberals and whites, you know, the, the whatever, 48% of whites or more that supported Obama, I think that that segment is representing, again, the interest, if you wish, of the class. And sometimes that enlightened segment has to take care of business. Same as in the 1830s, the enlightened segment of the bourgeoisie told the conservative segments, you're wrong. If we don't give some rights to workers, the system collapses. This is the only way of preserving capitalism. For this segment, I'm suggesting, this may be the moment of saying, this is better. You think that, given the, demo think about the demographic trends of America. Do you think that the minority masses will accept a softer version of Jim Crow? No, you would have a racial revolution. So whether you agree with me or not, this thing that is emerging, I call it the new racism, for lack of a better term, uh, and I'm talking about this multiracial white supremacy, is a much better alternative to preserve systemic white privilege. The other alternatives, going back to any kind of Jim Crow, softer version of, of Jim Crow, et cetera, that, that cannot work, yeah? So that would be sort of my, my, my answer to your question. And we can talk more after <laughs> uh, about this uh, deep, deep comment, yeah. I wondered if we could get your perceptions about uh, the new um, popular phrase, income inequality, which uh, of course has a phenomenon, is a phenomenon not unknown to minorities for a long time, but it seems to have some legs now. Um, do you think it will continue to have legs and why? I missed the first part, the perceptions of income inequality or the reality of income inequality? Uh, your perceptions of income inequality which uh, minorities have experienced for a long time. Uh, it seems to have some legs now, some, some force, and it seems to be the uh, thing to talk about. Do you think it will continue to be a, uh, a factor in you politics? Know, we had the Occupy movement, and for a little bit we thought, that's it, this may be the, the way out, yeah? I came in, uh, I, I returned to my place of birth in 1984, and then I was a vulgar Marxist who only saw class, yeah? I still remain convinced that class is one of the central components of American life, and I still believe that the riddle to the matrix of domination in this country is developing a formula to join class, race, and gender concerns. Of course, that's easy to say, <laughs> hard to do. Now, to answer the question, will the discussions and agitation around income inequality allow us to push forward a social democratic uh, agenda for the future? I don't think so. I don't think so. In part because of this new racial order, combined with your concern that 50% or so of whites are on the other side of history, and for them, they are willing to betray their class interests to defend their race interests, yeah? Uh, plus, let's give the elite uh, <laughs> some credit. They do know how to divide, they do know how to rule, and they are really good in selling the ideology that everybody can make it in America if you work hard. An ideology that is also now corroborated to some extent erratically, I think, with the election of Obama, yeah? Because part of the narrative of his election is, look, these people came from nothing, yeah? And unfortunately, both Obama and Michelle have been strong in making comments, particularly to minority kids, about, look, stay in school like I did, and look, you may end up in Harvard, etc. So although statistically speaking, this is absolute nonsense, yeah? The likelihood of poor people ending up in Harvard is quite small. The fact that you have this example, hey, you can become president, has become normal. How many of you have heard the argument out there? A colleague of mine at Michigan was telling me, but Eduardo, don't you think that now our kids can you know, aspire? I'm like, and I'm a social scientist. I'm like, actually, research on aspirations shows clearly our kids don't have a deficit in aspirations. We actually have slightly higher aspirations than white kids. What our kids lack is an equal opportunity structure to match their aspirations with possibilities for success. So how, how good is for me to be like, I want to be the king when I have no chance of becoming the king, yeah? And now, unfortunately, some people can say, well, actually, 
you may become the king. Because look at Obama. And I'm like, yeah, but if I have to do that, I have to, like, you know, retool myself, you know, be articulate, go to Harvard, be nice. When people call me names, I'm like, I hear you, I hear you, you know. And that's not how I, that's not how I roll out there, so. Okay, more. Anyway, uh, I hope I'm wrong, by the way. I hope I'm wrong, and that through the level of income inequality, the majority and minority masses join hands, as Marxists would predict, and fight the power. But we have been waiting for that for a long time, and ultimately, even if that is the, the vehicle to achieve social justice in America, we still need to be out there doing the politics and the organizing for that. It won't happen just because of objective conditions, yeah? So the whole argument about objective conditions determining everything, object, objective conditions are nothing unless we engage in political action. Ob objective conditions may kill people, and that doesn't mean people are going to organize along there. You know what? We should join hands with our black, brown folks to fight the power. The real power is the white bourgeoisie. They rule them the universe, and we should fight them. That's not the way things uh, work. More questions, comments? Oh, sorry. Yes. I thought you found someone back there. Um, thank you so much for your talk. I came over here from my CRT class where I had them watch Space Traders, so okay. it was listening. Uh, it was very interesting listening to, to what you had to say. I wish they could be here. But one of the things, that, a couple of things that you said that I found really interesting as I've tried to sort of wrap my own head around this is with Obama. So let's say we disregard the racial aspect, because uh, my opinion is I think it's okay. It's, it's sort of like the football thing. I, I, I think we would achieve equality when we have you know, an, a, an adequate black quarterback, just like we can have an in, you know, adequate white quarterback or an <laughs> inadequate black quarterback, like we have so many inadequate white quarterbacks. That, to me, is like some level of achievement. Um, so even for something like Obama, what, what I haven't been able to wrap my head around is, that, and you haven't mentioned it, and we're in Texas, is the Tea Party movement. In the sense that if Obama is everything that you're saying, he's really more right, he really isn't doing anything to move us socially or any other way, economically, uh, all of these things. I don't understand then the Tea Party movement and the characterization of him throughout a lot of the media, whether it's Fox News or listening to Morning Joe, rant about all of these things about Barack Obama, while on the one hand saying he's like Bush, right? Or other conservatives. But on the other hand saying, you know, oh, we're going towards socialism. Our country is going down. We're, it, it doesn't seem to connect. There is a disconnect somewhere between that ideology that's one. And the second thing is that the fact that the Tea Party formed as sort of this movement in the way that you're saying you want to see on the other side. And with something that seems to be as powerful as the Tea Party, but it's why... An astro, but be specific, it's an astroturf movement funded by the elite. So let's know that the beginning of the so-called movement was really all these rich folks putting money, uh, paying for buses to go and, 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 and rally against... Uh, mostly democratic uh, uh, leaders, etc. Now, the right wing then lost control <laughs> over the Tea Party, and now they're going crazy, and they're going even against their folks, yeah? But the beginning of the, of the movement was uh, 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 funded, big time. We have the data on that, yeah? But by all these uh, rich folks, the Koch brothers, for example, gave tons of money to make sure that this thing uh, 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 worked. Now, that connects and dovetails well with the last question. This is not news to us. The, the white masses, the white workers of the world, the poor whites, have not been in synthony with our interests for years. Yeah? Uh, there is a good book called Deer Hunting with Jesus. It's a really good book. Uh, the author died three years ago, forgot his last name. Uh, and what he shows is, he goes to one of these rural poor communities and shows that one of the reasons why we progressives are losing out is because we abandon these communities and who is taking the, the, the space? 
First, the local elites, maybe elites, but they go and go to the bars and talk, and talk to folks, and although they may treat them as second-class citizens, they are there. We are not even there. Then we don't provide any kind of counter-ideology to what they're saying. So forget about Fox News. Yeah, they do watch Fox News, but you know what? It is talk radio. For the workers of the world, it's talk radio. And most of us don't, wa don't listen to uh, Rush Limbo or this fellow Savage and all these people. The white uh, members of, uh, <laughs> poor whites, are listening to all these folks and not, not understanding what is going on, why they're not making ends meet, why they're losing their jobs. It, <laughs> the easy explanation, which is because of black people, gays, lesbians, <laughs> and a socialist president who is Muslim on the side, by the way, uh, and who is not even American, yeah? Those easy explanations have become like normative. But again, this is not new to us. We have had this for a long, long time. What we're seeing now is that we see what you call a movement version of the ferment that has been there for years, yeah? And it's not a nice ferment. Now, there is a way for us to turn that back. So you talk about, let me, let me challenge you with an analogy of the quarterback. We don't need a quarterback. What we need is a team. What we need is organizing yeah, movements. They forget about the quarterback. Quarterbacks can be injured yeah, or die or become ineffective. But if you have a team, which is what we need, a social movement, we may be able to counter. And that will include, going back to the last question about income inequality, us working with the white masses. At the end of the day, we have more in common. We most of us, people of color, have more in common with the white majority than with the white elite. And that is a hard work. I'm not saying that it's easy to go in, going to West Virginia, uh, North Carolina, Georgia, South Carolina, Mississippi, Alabama, actually, <laughs> half of Texas, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It, <laughs> by the way, Michigan, Wisconsin is not much better. It's hard work. But if we do what we're doing, which is we abandon them and just focus on, quote, unquote, our people, and I'm not saying not to organize our people. We have to do that. But we also, if we want social justice for us and for everybody, we should be also working there. And what are we doing? Let me be pessimistic optimistic about our future. What will happen, so I, I sort of waste time giving these talks because at the end of the day, I, I can predict what most of us will do. In November of 2014, all of you will be like, wow, we need to vote in these elections because they're fundamental. If the Democrats don't get control of And in 2016, you know what you're going to do? I cannot believe that the Republican Party nominated these fascists. We use the word fascist in the U.S. in a very, like, you know, hey, everybody's a fascist. Yeah? And because we claim that whoever the Republicans nominate is a fascist, we all end up not doing the work that I think needs to be done, and just go and do a little bit of electoral work, and then we vote, and then after the elections, what do we do? Go back to watching Morning Joe. So, so the onus is on us. It's our collective responsibility to work for social change. Social change will not happen by just getting the better quarterback. It will happen by us getting the better team. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, who decides? Okay, I, I'll, I'll fill both of them, one, two. And, and what we'll do is, you ask the question, you ask, and then I try to. Yes, yes. Oh, you need the mic, yeah. Oh, there, okay. Does that make me next? We have a social movement going on. So maybe we only have one more question. Okay, depending on how our... Sister, ask the question. Okay, shoot. Thank you. Good afternoon to each and every one of you. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Um, my question is relating to the same vein that you're talking about right now. I'm um, coming back from a year of being in Mexico. And uh, right now, Michoacan is being attacked um, by the cartels. So the community police is organizing and mobilizing against the cartels, and now the state of Mexico and the federales are coming in to try to maintain order. Um, in Mexico and a lot of Latino co uh, communities and countries, 
um, they have a different sense of community. They have what really embodies a community. And so it challenges when people come from the United States and claim a community, um, they ask them, the first question they ask you is what's your cargo or what's your responsibility or your role in the community? Here, being born and raised as an American, um, which carries that Western culture that's heavily rooted in individualism um, and capitalism, how do you, what are some of the ways that we can overcome those barriers of the culture that we uh, are born into and, and live in every single day and feel the pressures of in every single moment um, in order to build, rebuild that sense of community and uh, start to I'm mobilize? I'm going to sound like a broken record, but the answer to everything is social movement and politics. You want a new culture. If anyone here has participated in social movements, you all realize that when you are in a movement, new ideas emerge, new music, new visions, sometimes new sort of social relationships, yeah? So I participated in two important social movements in my life, one in a squatter settlement movement, and another one in a student movement in the 80s. Later on in the US, I did a little few things, but the US, you know, <laughs> was, is not the beacon of social movement activity. So at any rate, if you want a new culture, a new vision of community, that will not be taught to people, you know, so you cannot go to school and, okay, let me teach you community. Be nice. Care for one another. Yeah? So what you do is, social movements also produce new cultures, new understandings, yeah? If, for example, we have a movement in which women are in a central position in the movement, as they should, that could potentially help us rethink anew the position of women in society. And it would be harder for people to sort of practice uh, sexism as they do, yeah? Similar in terms of race. If in this movement we have relations of camaraderie and friendship, emotion and maybe even love, hard for you not to think of one another as, you know, we are brothers and sisters, yeah? That's the language of movement, brothers and sisters. So if we want a new culture, I think the fastest way of getting there is through social movement activity. I am a firm believer that social movements are central because as a social scientist and a student of history, I think that fundamental social changes have occurred throughout history because of people's movements, yeah? Because of social protests, because of politics, yeah? Politics meaning beyond just electoral politics. I'm not, by the way, I'm not saying never vote. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying if you need to vote, go ahead and vote as I did in 2008. But don't assume that that is all that politics encompasses, yeah? Voting is a segment of political activity. And in the U.S., since 1980, since Ronald Reagan's election, we progressives, we liberals, stopped doing the other kind of politics for the most part and have focused only on every four years, give money. So as we get old and, you know, accumulate a bit of money, we're like, I'm going to give Obama all the money I can give him because of the Tea Party idiots, yeah? And then we don't do anything else. And that, ultimately, will not help us get to the promised land. Okay, Rogelio, I think I'm tired. 